Forbidden Colors by Yuki Omishima Chapter 1 The Beginning Yasuko had grown accustomed to coming and blithely seating herself on Shunsuke's lap as he rested in the rattan chair at the edge of the garden. This brought him great joy. It was the summer of 1950. Mornings Shunsuke received no visitors. If he felt like it, he would work. If he didn't, he would write letters, or have his chair set out in the garden and stretch out in it with a book, or close his book on his lap and do nothing, or ring a bell and have a maid bring him tea, or if for some reason he had not had enough sleep the night before, he would pull his blanket up to his chin and drop off for a little while. Although he was five years past sixty, he had no diversions, nothing worthy of being called a hobby. In fact, he didn't believe in them. He was entirely deficient in the quality so important to a hobby, appreciation of the concrete relationships that tied him fast to other men. This acute deficiency in objectivity, accompanied by clumsy, convulsive stabs at establishing a relationship between his inner world and that which lay outside it, imparted a certain freshness and naivete even to the works of his later years, but they took their toll. They took the strength from the very vitals of his fiction, the dramatic incidents, born of the collision of human wills, the humorous portrayals, the urge to limb human character, all nurtured by the rivalry between the human being and his world. On this score, two or three of the crustier critics still hesitated to acclaim him a great writer. Shunsuke's right knee was plagued by seizures of neuralgia. Before each onset he would feel a dim pain deep inside it. It was doubtful that his aging brittle kneecaps could stand the warm weight of a young woman upon them for very long. As the pain increased, however, an expression of joy slyly stole across his features. Finally he said, my knee hurts, Yasuko. Let me move my leg over like this, and you sit there, so. Yasuko opened her eyes wide and looked at Shunsuke with concern. He laughed, Yasuko loathed him. The old novelist understood this loathing. He stood up and grasped Yasuko by the shoulders. Then he took her chin in his hand, tipped it back, and kissed her on the lips. Then, his duty to her thus hurriedly completed, he felt a sudden flash of pain in his right knee and slumped back in his chair. When he was finally able to lift up his face and look around him, Yasuko had disappeared. A week afterward, he had still not heard from Yasuko. While taking a walk one day. He dropped by her house. She had gone with two or three school friends to a hot springs resort on the southern coast of the Izu Peninsula. After jotting down the name of the resort in his memo book, he returned home and began making preparations for a trip. There was a stack of proofs urgently calling for his attention, but he took care of them for the time being by saying that he suddenly felt the need to take a midsummer vacation. Concerned about the heat, he took an early morning train. Nevertheless, the back of his white suit was soon soaked with perspiration. He took a sip of the hot tea in his thermos bottle. Then he put his slender hand, dry as bamboo, into his pocket and took out some of the advertising brochures for his next collected works, given him by one of the people at his publishers. This new collection of the works of Shunsuke Inoki would be his third. The first one was assembled when he was 45. At that point in time, I recall, he thought to himself, that in spite of the great accumulation of my works acclaimed by the world as the epitome of stability and unity and, in a sense, having reached the pinnacle, as many predicted, I was quite given over to this foolishness. Foolishness? Nonsense. Foolishness could never be connected with my works, with my soul, with my thinking. My works are certainly not foolishness. Italics were often a sign that he was speaking ironically. Not only that, I was above using thought in mitigation of my foolishness. In order to maintain the purity of my thinking, I kept free from my foolish activities enough spirit to allow my thoughts to form. Sex was, however, not the only motivating force. My foolishness had nothing to do with sex or spirit. My foolishness lay in a wild ability to handle abstractions which threatened to make me misanthropic. It still threatens, even now in my 66th year. With a sad smile on his lips, 
He studied the picture of himself on the cover of the prospectus he held in his hand. It was a picture of an ugly old man. That was the only way to put it. However, it was not difficult to see in it certain dim and delicate traces of the spiritual beauty so acclaimed by the world. The broad forehead, the clipped, narrow cheeks, the broad, hungry lips, the willful chin, in every feature the traces of long, hard work and of spirit lay open to the light. His face, however, was not so much molded by spirit as riddled with it. It was a face in which an excess of soul was laid bare, causing the onlooker to shrink from looking at it directly, as if it talked too openly of private things. In its ugliness his face was a corpse emaciated of spirit, no longer possessing the power to retain its privacy. It was their doing. Shunsuke's features were termed beautiful by that admirable group which, having been poisoned by the intellectual hedonism of the times, having replaced concern for humanity with individualism, having extirpated universality from the sense of beauty, had larcenously and violently tom beauty from the arms of ethics. Be that as it may, on the back of the prospectus that boldly bore the features of an ugly old man, rows of testimonials by numerous prominent men presented a strange contrast to what was on the front. These great men of intellect, this flock of bald parrots prepared to sing a loud song wherever and as directed, were singing of the uncanny beauty of the works of Shunsuk. One renowned critic, for example, a well-known Hinoki scholar, summarized the entire twenty volumes of the works as follows. This great shower of works cascading into our hearts was written in sincerity and finished in mistrust. Mr. Hinoki states that if he didn't have that instinct of mistrust in his works he would have thrown them away as soon as written. Was ever such a row of corpses laid before the eyes of the public? In Shunsu Hinoki's works, the unexpected, instability, the unlucky, misfortune, the unseemly, impropriety all the minus quantities of beauty are depicted. If a certain historical period is to be used as background, without fail a decadent period is chosen. If a love story is needed for subject matter, without fail the emphasis is placed on the hopelessness and the tedium of it. In his hands the healthy, flourishing form is a passionate loneliness in the human mind exploding with the intensity of an epidemic raging in a tropical city. All the fierce hatreds, the jealousies, the enmities, the passions of humankind, he does not seem to be concerned with. Not only that, he finds much more to write about, much more living, essential value, in a single capillary of warmth in the corpse of the passions than in a living period of human feeling. In the midst of coldness comes a clever shudder of feeling. In the midst of immorality appears an almost ferocious morality. In the midst of coldness, a heroic unrest makes itself felt. What masterfully wrought style must this be to intrude into the purlieus of paradox? It is a Rococo style, one out of the old Hyen times. It is a human style in the real sense of the word. It is a clothed style for the sake of clothing. It is the diametrical opposite of a bare style. It is filled with lovely ducks and pleats, like those in the sculptures of the fates in the gable of the Parthenon, or those in the clothing of the Nike by Ponius. Flowing pleats, flying pleats, not simply those that follow the motions of the body and so subordinate themselves to its lines. These are pleats that flow of themselves, that of themselves fly to heaven. A smile of irritation flickered about Shunsuke's mouth as he read. Then he muttered, I don't get it at all. He missed the boat completely. It's a fabricated, flowery eulogy. That's all it is. After twenty years, he turns out tripe like this. He turned to look out of the broad window of the second-class coach. The sea was in view, and a fishing boat, its sail spread, was heading for the open water. The white canvas, its whim not quite filled with wind, clung to the mast, languidly flirted with it. At that instant a sliver of light glinted from the base of the mast, then the train sliced into a grove of red pines, their trunks bright in the morning sun of summer, then it entered a tunnel. Well, Shunsuk thought, I wouldn't be surprised if that glimmer of light came from a mirror. There must be a fisherwoman aboard that boat who's in the middle of making herself pretty. 
in her sunburnt hand, stronger than a man's, she is probably sending off side along signals toward the passengers of each passing train, in order to retail her secrets. In Shunsuke's poetic fancy the face of the fisherwoman changed to that of Yasuko. The aging writer shook his thin, sweaty frame. All the fierce hatreds, the jealousies, the enmities, the passions of humankind he does not seem to be concerned with. Lies. 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 The process in which a writer is compelled to counterfeit his true feelings is exactly the opposite of that in which the man of society is compelled to counterfeit his. The artist disguises in order to reveal. The man of society disguises in order to conceal. Another result of Shunsuke's reticence was the attack on his lack of intellectuality by the people who sought to bring about the unity of the arts and the social sciences. It stood to reason that he would have no part of the silly display of philosophy in the epilogue of a work, much like a burlesque girl pulling up her skirt and exposing her thighs. Just the same, there was something in the thinking of Shunsuke, in his attitude toward art and life, that persistently invited sterility. What we call thought is not born before the fact but after the fact. It enters as the defense attorney of an action born of accident and impulse. As defense attorney it gives meaning and theory to that action, necessity is substituted for chance, will for impulse. Thinking cannot heal the wounds of a blind man who has walked into a lamppost, but it can show that the lamppost and not the blindness was at fault. To one action after another theory after the fact is applied until theory becomes the system. The agent of actions becomes nothing more than the probabilities within all actions. That's what through the scrap of paper in the street. It thought and through the scrap of paper in the street. In this way he who possesses the power of thinking, seeking to extend that power beyond all limits, becomes himself the prisoner of thought. Shunsuk drew a sharp line between thought and foolishness. As a result of this he blamed his foolishness without extenuation. The ghost of his foolishness, rigidly excluded from his works, nightly stalked his rest. Surely his three disastrous marriages might be glimpsed once or more in his works. In his youth that fellow Shunsuke's life had been a succession of debacles, a chain of miscalculations and failures. He knew nothing of hatreds. A lie. Nothing of jealousy. A lie. In contrast to the serene resignation that floated within his works, the life of Shunsuk was filled with hatred, with jealousy. After the breakdown of his third marriage, after the clumsy resolutions of ten or so love affairs, the fact that this old artist, beset by an ineradicable detestation of womankind, had never once decked out his works with the blossom of the detestation was an achievement of immeasurable self-restraint, of immeasurable arrogance. The women who entered the pages of his humorous books appeared to women as well as men among his readers as annoyingly pure. One curious scholar of comparative literature placed his heroines alongside the ethereal heroines of Edgar Allan Poe, namely, Ligia, Berenice, Moralia, and the Marquess Aphrodite, more marble than flesh. Their easily wearying passions were like the transient light of the afternoon sun reflecting here and the rough carved features. Shunsuk was afraid to endow his heroines with deep feeling. One good-humoured critic pointed to Shunsuk and said that his position of eternal feminist was absolutely charming. His first wife had been a thief. In their two years of married life she cleverly stole and sold a winter overcoat, three pairs of shoes, material for two spring suits, and a Zeiss camera just on a whim. When she went out, her neck bend and her sash were studded with jewels. Shunsuk was, after all, a rich man. His second wife had been mad. Obsessed by the notion that her husband would kill her in her sleep she grew so weak from lack of rest that she became hysterical. One day Shunsuk returned home and was greeted by a strange odor. His wife stood at the door, barring the way, refusing to allow her husband to enter. Let me in, he said. What's that strange smell? No, you can't come in, she said. I'm doing something very exciting. What? You're always leaving me and going off somewhere, so I snatched the kimono off the back of your mistress, and I'm burning it. My, it feels good. 
he pushed his way in and saw pieces of charcoal smoldering all over the Persian rug. His wife walked back to the stove and, daintily holding back her long sleeve, in perfect composure, scooped out the burning charcoal and sprinkled it on the rug. In dismay, Shun Suk restrained her. With terrible strength, his wife struggled to free herself. Like a captive bird beating its wings to the full extent of its power she resisted. Her whole body, sinew and flesh, had gone rigid. His third wife had been with him until her death. This woman of great sexual need gave Shun Suk a taste of every variety of husbandly agony. He clearly remembered the first morning of that agony. Shun Suk's work always had to wait until after the act, but its pace had picked up enormously. About nine o'clock at night he and his wife would go to bed. After a while he would leave her and go up to his study on the second floor, work there until three or four in the morning, and then go to sleep again on the little bed in the study. He kept to this routine rigidly. From the previous night until about ten in the morning he never saw his wife. Late one summer night he felt a strange impulse to shock his wife out of her slumber. His strong desire to go on with his work, however, led him to resist the impulse and the mischief it entailed. Until five o'clock that morning, in fact, as if to punish himself, he worked without let up. He had lost all desire to sleep. Surely his wife was still sleeping. Noiselessly he crept down the stairs. The bedroom door was open. His wife was nowhere to be seen. In that instant Shun Suk was struck with the feeling that this was what usually went on. That must be why I've been keeping myself to this schedule, he thought to himself. I must have known it, I must have feared it. He soon got himself under control. His wife must have thrown her black velvet robe over her nightgown, as usual, and gone to the bathroom. He waited. She didn't return. Shun Suk walked uneasily down the hall toward the downstairs lavatory. Under the kitchen window, at the kitchen table, the black-robed form of his wife quietly rested, propped forward on its arms. It was not yet dawn. He could not tell whether the dim figure was sitting or kneeling. Shun Suk hid behind the thick damask curtains that led to the hall. As he did so he heard the squeal of the wooden gate twenty-five or thirty feet from the kitchen door. He heard a low, musical whistle. It was time for the milk delivery. From the yards nearby the dogs barked, one after another. The milkman wore sneakers. Over the stone walk wet with the night's rain he bounded joyously, his body flushed from labor, his bare arms extending from his blue polo shirt and brushing the wet leaves of the eight-finger shrubs, the cold wet stones passing behind him. The clear note of his whistle bespoke the freshness of his young lips in the morning. She stood up and opened the kitchen door. In the grey night a black human shape could be seen. His teeth, white as he smiled, and his blue polo shirt showed faintly. The morning wind came in and shook the tassels of the curtain. Thank you, said Shun Suke's wife. She took two bottles of milk. The sound of the bottles clinking together and the silvery clink of her ring against the glass reverberated softly. You'll give me something for it, ma'am, won't you? The young man said, insolently bantering. Not today, she said. How about tomorrow noon? No, that's out, too. But only once in ten days. Have you found somebody else? Don't talk so loud. Day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. Shun Suke's wife pronounced that day after tomorrow as if she were coyly placing a piece of fragile china back on the shelf. In the evening, though, my husband is going to a meeting. It will be okay to come then. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. His wife opened the door, which had been shut. The young man made no move to leave. He struck the door post two or three times, softly. How about now? What are you saying? My lord and master is upstairs. I hate people who don't have any sense. Okay. Just a kiss. Not here. If somebody sees us we've had it. Just a kiss. You're a nuisance. Just a kiss. The young man closed the door behind him and stood in the entranceway to the kitchen. 
She stepped down to him in her rabbit fur bedroom slippers. The two of them stood together, like a rose beside a pole. A wave-like undulation passed from time to time from her back to her hips down her black velvet gown. His hand groped out and loosened her belt. Shunsuke's wife shook her head, resisting. They scuffled silently. Until this moment her back had been toward Shunsuke. Now it was the man's back. Her open gown was toward him. She had nothing on underneath. The young man knelt down in the narrow entryway. Shunsuke had never seen anything so white as the naked body of his wife standing there in the grey dawn. It was not standing, that white embodiment, it was floating. Like the hand of a blind man, her hand moved, feeling for the hair of the kneeling young man. What could the eyes of his wife be looking at now, first gleaming, then clouding, then opening wide, then staring half-closed? At the enameled pans on the shelves. At the cupboard doors. At the view of the trees in the dawn through the window. At the glint of the sun bouncing off the doorpost. The intimate silence of that kitchen, like that of a sleeping barracks before the activity of the day, could surely conceive nothing within the eyes of his wife. Yet something was clear in those eyes, and it was somewhere in this curtain. And as if they were conscious of it, they never once met the eyes of Shunsuke. They are eyes that have been instructed from childhood never to look at one's husband, Shunsuk shuddered as this thought came over him. At the same time the wish to propel himself suddenly out the vanished. He was unable to utter a word and, what was more, knew no way to get revenge. After a time the young man slid open the door and departed. The garden was turning white. Silently Shunsuk retreated to the second floor. This writer, gentleman beyond measure, had only one way of getting rid of the resentments his life brought him. It was his French diary, in which on certain days he would write pages. He had never been abroad, but he had mastered French. Three works of Heisman's, La Cathedrale, La Baz, and En Route, as well as Rodenbach's Bruges La Mort he had transmuted into splendid Japanese just to get his hand going. Were this journal made public after his death, there would probably be much discussion as to whether it were more valuable than his works per se. All the important elements that his works were deficient in flourished in the pages of this diary, but transferring them verbatim into those works ran counter to the wishes of Shunsuk, who hated the naked truth. He held firmly to the belief that any part of one's talent, be it what it may, which revealed itself spontaneously was a fraud. Not only that, at the root of the lack of objectivity in his works lay his creative attitude, his excessively stubborn adherence to subjectivity. He hated the naked truth to excess and made his works sculptures of the raw flesh of its naked body. As soon as he got back to his study he plunged into his diary, into the painful description of the assignation in the dawn. It was written in the wildest hand, almost as if he intended that he himself would not be able to read it when he came back to it a second time. As with the diaries of decades past piled on his shelf, the pages of this diary too were filled with curses directed against women. If the curses had no effect, it was in the last analysis because the one doing the cursing was not a woman but a man. It is easier to quote fragments, such as the following one, from this memorandum filled more with jottings and aphorisms than entries in airy form. Here is the record of one day of his youth. Women can bring nothing into the world but children. Men can father all kinds of things besides children. Creation, reproduction, and propagation are all male capabilities. Feminine pregnancy is but a part of child rearing. This is an old truth. Incidentally Shunsuke had no children. It was half a matter of principle. Woman's jealousy is simply jealousy of creativity. A woman who bears a son and brings him up tastes the honeyed joy of revenge against creativity. When she stands in the way of creation she feels she has something to live for. The craving for luxury and spending is a destructive craving. Everywhere you look, feminine instincts win out. Originally capitalism was a carrot male theory, a reproductive theory. Then feminine thinking it away at it. Capitalism changed into a theory of extravagance. Thanks to this Helen, war finally came into being. In the far distant future,
communism too will be destroyed by woman. Woman survives everywhere and rules like the night. Her nature is on the highest pinnacle of baseness. She drags all values down into the slough of sentiment. She is entirely incapable of comprehending doctrine, istic, she can understand, ism, she cannot fathom. Lacking in originality she can't even comprehend the atmosphere. All she can figure out is the smell. She smells as a pig does. Perfume is a masculine invention designed to improve woman's sense of smell. Thanks to it, man escapes being sniffed out by woman. Woman's sexual charm, her coquettish instincts, all the powers of her sexual attraction, prove that woman is a useless creature. Something useful would have no need of coquetries. What a waste it is that man insists on being attracted by woman. What disgrace it brings down upon man's spiritual powers. Woman has no soul. She can only feel. What is called majestic feeling is the most laughable of paradoxes, a self-made tapeworm. The majesty of motherhood that once in a while develops and shocks people has in truth no relation to spirit. It is no more than a physiological phenomenon, essentially no different from the self-sacrificing mother love seen in animals. In short, spirit must be viewed as the special characteristic that differentiates man from the animals. It is the only essential difference. Essential difference, it might be better to call it the peculiarly human capability of fictional creation. It might be discovered upon the features in the picture of the 25-year-old Shunsuk that was inserted in the diary. They were ugly features, yet there was in their aspect a certain man-made ugliness, the ugliness of a man who strove day by day to believe himself ugly. In that year's diary, carefully written in French, might be found various random, outrageous doodles. There were two or three rude sketches of the vagina, roughly scratched over with a cancelling X he was cursing the vagina. Shunsuk did not marry a thief and a madwoman because no other brides were available. There were enough spiritual women who could find this promising young man interesting. But the creature that was the spiritual woman was a monster and not really a woman. The only women who could be unfaithful to Shunsuk were the ones who refused to understand his lone strong point, his one beautiful feature, his soul. These indeed were the original, the true, the genuine women. Shunsuk could only love these beautiful Messalinas, sure of their beauty, who did not require spirit to round out their charms. The lovely face of his third wife, three years dead, floated into Shunsuke's mind. At fifty, she and her lover not half her age had committed suicide. Shunsuk knew why she had taken her life. She feared the prospect of an ugly old age spent in his company. Their dead bodies were thrown up together on Inubo Point, deposited by the waves high on the rocks. It was no easy task to get them off. Fishermen fastened ropes to them and passed them from rock to rock in the white spume thrown up by the booming surf. Nor was it easy to separate their corpses. They had melted together like wet tissue paper, their skin seemingly shared in common. The remains of Shunsuke's wife, forcibly pried loose, were sent to Tokyo for cremation, according to her husband's wishes. It was a magnificent funeral, the ceremony was over, and the time had come to start the procession. The aged husband took his leave of the deceased, who had been carried into another room. No one else entered, as he instructed. Above her tremendously swollen face, buried with lilies and pinks, the roots of her hair seemed to glisten in blue striations out of a semi-transparent hairline. Without apprehension Shunsuk stared at this ugliest of all faces. Then he sensed the malice in that face. It could cause her husband no more pain, her face no longer had to be beautiful. Was not this the reason it was ugly? He took his treasured no mask representing young womanhood and placed it over her face. Harder and harder he pressed against it, so that the face of the drowned woman buckled under the mask like so much ripe fruit. No one would know what Shunsuk had done. In an hour or so all traces of it would be consumed in flame. In pain and indignation, Shunsuk went through the period of mourning. When he recalled the dawning day that marked the beginning of his pain, his response was so fresh that he found it hard to believe his wife was not still alive. 
he had had more rivals than he had fingers, and their youthful arrogance, their hateful good looks. Shun Suk had taken a stick to one of them, and his wife had threatened to leave him. So he apologized to his wife and bought the boy a suit of clothes. Later the fellow was killed fighting in North China. Drunk with joy, Shun Suk wrote a long passage in his diary. Then, like one possessed, he went for a walk down the street. It was jammed with soldiers departing for the front, with all their well wishes. He joined a crowd of people around a soldier saying goodbye to a lovely girl, obviously his fiance. Somehow Shun Suk found himself joyfully waving a paper flag. A cameraman happened to be passing at the moment and caught him, so Shun Suk's picture appeared prominently in the newspapers, waving the flag. Who could have known? Here was this eccentric author waving a flag, sending off a soldier to die on the battlefield, the very battlefield on which had recently died the detested young soldier whose death he was really celebrating. These were the thoughts passing through the mind of Shunsu Kinoki during the hour and a half bus trip that was the last leg of his journey to the shore where Yasuko was. Then the war ended, he thought. She committed suicide the second year afterward. The newspapers were polite, they called it a heart attack. Only a small number of my friends knew the real facts. After my mourning period was over, I fell in love with the wife of a former count. My life of 10 plus love affairs was fulfilled, it seemed, with this love. At a critical moment, her husband appeared demanding 300,000 yen. The former count had a sideline, with his wife as a partner, blackmail. The memory made him laugh. The blackmail episode was funny, though the humor made him uneasy. I wonder whether I am still capable of hating women as fiercely as when I was young. He thought of Yasuko. This 19-year-old girl who had come to see him several times since they met in Hakon in May. The old writer's breast heaved. In the middle of May, when Shun Suk was working at Nakagora, a girl staying in the same hotel asked, through the maid, for his autograph. He met the girl eventually near the garden. She was on her way to meet him, one of his works under her arm. It was a lovely evening. He had been out for a walk and met her on the way back, as he climbed the stone steps. Is it you? Shunsuk asked. Yes. My last name is Segawa, she said. How do you do? She was wearing a pink dress, the kind a child would wear. Her arms and legs were long and graceful, perhaps too long. The skin of her thighs were tight, like that of a freshwater fish. It was white skin, with gamboge depths, gleaming out from under the hem of her short skirt. Shunsuk guessed she was 17 or 18. From the expression around her eyes, though, one would guess her to be 20 or 21. She was wearing getter, revealing her trim heels, small, modest, firm, bird-like dot to her is your room. Way back there. That's why I haven't seen you. Are you alone? Yes, today, that is. She was convalescing from a bout with pneumonia. It pleased Shun Suk that she was a girl who was only able to read novels for the story. Her companion, an elderly woman, had gone back to Tokyo for a day or two on business. He could have gone back to his room with Yasuko, autographed her book, and returned it to her at once, but he wanted to arrange to meet for the book the following day, so they sat down on one of the ugly benches by the garden. There they talked about this and that there really was no topic that could speed intimacy between this shy old man and this proper young woman. When did you come? What's your family like? Do you feel better now? Things like that Shun Suk asked, and she answered with a quiet smile. Thus it was surprising how soon the garden seemed to become wrapped in twilight. In front of them, the soft shapes of Miyojo Peak and Tateyama to the right of it grew darker and quietly sidled their way into the thoughts of those watching them. Between the two mountains sank the Odawara Sea. The flashing of the lighthouse glimmed like the evening star somewhere in the area where the twilight sky and the narrow seascape dimly merged. The maid came to announce dinner, and they parted. The next day, Yasuko and her elderly companion came to Shunsuke's room bringing with them some sweets from Tokyo. He brought out the two volumes, 
which had already been signed. The old woman did all the talking, affording Yasuko and Shunsuke the luxury of silence. After Yasuko and the woman left, Shunsuke took it into his head to take a long walk. He panted as he scrambled irritably up the hill. It doesn't matter how far, I can do it. I'm still not tired. See how I can walk, he told himself. Finally he came to a grassy spot shaded by a tree. There he stretched out, as if unconscious. Suddenly a huge pheasant launched out of a bush at one side. Shunsuke started. Then he felt his heart leaping with a restless joy born of overexertion. It's been a long time since I had this feeling. How many years? Shunsuke thought to himself. He chose to forget that this feeling was for the most part of his own making, that in order to create this feeling he had designedly taken this unusually vigorous hike. Surely such forgetfulness, such willfulness, could be attributed to his advanced age. The bus route from the nearest railroad station to the town where Yasuko was staying passed close to the sea at several points. From the top of the cliffs one got a bird's eye view of the flashing summer sea. A transparent and therefore barely visible incandescent glow lit up the surface of the sea. It was still long before noon. The two or three passengers in the bus were local people, but they spread outside dishes wrapped in bamboo sheaths and started eating their bulled rice. Shunsuk barely knew what it was like to be conscious that his stomach was empty. When he was thinking, he would eat and then forget he had eaten, then wonder why his stomach was full. His viscera as well as his mind were oblivious to the vicissitudes of daily life. The K Park stop was two stations away from the terminal point, K Town Hall. Nobody got off there. The bus route sliced through the center of this great park, which covered about a thousand hectares between the mountains and the sea. One side had the mountains as its focal point, the other side had the sea. Through the thick shrubbery, noisy in the wind, Shunsuk caught glimpses of the deserted, silent playground, and of the sea, its blue enamel expanse broken here and there in the distance, and of sundry park swings that threw motionless shadows on the shining sand. For no reason that he could fathom, that great park, silent in the mist dumber morning, intrigued him. The bus stopped at a corner of the jumbled little town. Around the town hall there were no signs of life. Through the open windows the white tops of the desks, on which nothing was piled, threw out gleams of light. The welcoming party from the hotel bowed. Shunsuk gave them his baggage and slowly climbed the stone staircase they had pointed out beside the shrine. Thanks to the wind off the sea, the heat was barely noticeable. The voices of the cicadas came down from overhead languidly. Warm sounds wrapped in wool. Halfway up the stairs, Shunsuk took off his hat and rested a while. Below him in the little harbor a little green steamer rested. It let off steam noisily, as if prompted. Then it stopped. As it did so, the all too simple curve of the still harbor seemed all at once filled with a doleful sound as of countless wings, like the buzzing of a persistent fly. No matter how often one chases it, it will not be driven off. What a fine view. Shunsuk said that as if to get the idea out of his mind. It was certainly not a fine view. The view from the hotel is better, sir. Is that so? The old author's dignity stemmed from the fact that he was too lazy to take the trouble to indulge in teasing and ridicule. It wearied him to break his composure even for a moment. They had given him the finest room in the hotel, where he asked the maid the questions he had prepared on the way and found so difficult to phrase with requisite casualness. To make matters worse, he feared he had lost all casualness. Has a young lady named Segawa checked in? Yes. She's here. His heart was pounding, so he pronounced the next question slowly. Does she have someone with her? Yes. They arrived four or five days ago. In the chrysanthemum room. Maybe she's here now. I'm a friend of her father's. She just went out to K-Park. Did she go alone? No, she is not alone. The maid did not say they went with her. Under the circumstances, Shunsuk was filled with dismay. 
He did not know how to ask with proper indifference how many friends there were and whether male or female. If her friends were male, what if there was only one of them? Wasn't it strange that this very natural question had never even entered his head until now? Foolishness preserves its own undeviating equilibrium, does it not? Until it gets its way it advances, suppressing every proper intelligent consideration. He felt his attendance was more commanded than invited as he was subjected to a lavish welcome by the hotel. Throughout his bath and his meal, until the business was over, he was given no rest. When he was finally left alone he was overcome by excitement and moved restlessly. His anxiety impelled him to do something a gentleman should not do. He quietly entered the chrysanthemum room. The suite was in perfect order. He opened the western-style clothes closet in the smaller room and saw a man's white trousers and white poplin shirts. They were hanging next to Yasuko's Tyrolean applique white linen one-piece suit. He turned his eyes to the dressing table and saw pomade and a stick of hair wax beside the powder, cream, and lipstick. He left the room, returned to his own, and rang the bell. When the maid came he ordered a car. While he was putting on his suit, the car arrived. He was driven to K-Park. He told the driver to wait and entered the gate of the park, which was deserted, as usual. It had a new, natural stone arch. From it, one could not see the sea. In the wind, the heavy branches of the trees, covered with blackish-green leaves, sat like the distant surf. Shunsuk decided to go to the beach. There, he had been told, they swam every day. He left the playground. He passed the corner of the little zoo, in which a badger was huddled, dozing, the shadow of the cage sharp upon his back. In its grazing area, at the point where two keyed trees grew close together, a long black rabbit slept quietly, beyond the heat. Shunsuk descended a stone staircase covered thickly with grass and saw, on the other side of a vast patch of shrubbery, the expanse of the ocean. As far as his eyes could see, there was only the movement of branches. The wind slowly made its way toward him. It twisted nimbly from branch to branch, seeming to approach like an invisible small animal. The roughest blasts of wind that came at times were like the frolicking of an invisible large animal. Over all this the unfailing sunlight reigned. The unfailing buzz of the cicada prevailed. What path should he take down to the beach? Far below, he could see a grove of pines. The grass-covered staircase seemed to lead down the by a roundabout route. He was bathed in the sun that forced its way through the trees, dazzled by the fierce glare off the grass, and he came to realize that his body was covered with perspiration. The staircase curved. He struggled his way onto the edge of a narrow corridor of beach at the foot of the cliff. There was nobody there. Exhausted, the aging writer seated himself on a boulder. Anger it was that had brought him this far. Living as he did, encompassed by his great reputation, the religious veneration in which he was held, his multifarious business affairs, his miscellaneous friendships, and all the related unendingly venomous essentials, he generally required no escape from life. The most extreme escape for him would be to come close to it. Within the amazingly broad sphere of his acquaintanceship, Shunsu Kinoki performed like a great actor, through whose skill thousands of spectators were made to feel that he was close to each of them alone. An adroit skill it was, seemingly in disregard of all the laws of perspective. Neither their praise nor their criticism touched him. That was because he was deaf to everything. He was trembling now in anticipation of being hurt, fiercely desired to be hurt. Only in this sense did Shunsuk in his own inimitable way seek an escape. In short, he sought consummation in a climactic reception unto himself of clear, unequivocal injury. Now, however, the unusually close, undulating broad sea seemed to soothe Shunsuk. As it craftily and nimbly came in between the rocks again and again, the sea soaked him, it flowed into his being, it instantly painted him with its blueness. Then it fell away from him again. Then a ripple appeared out in the middle of the ocean. A delicate, white splashing like an advancing wave developed. The ripple advanced rapidly in the direction of this part of the shore. As it reached the shallows and seemed about to break, suddenly in the middle of the wave a swimmer stood out. 
Quickly his body seemed to erase the wave. Then he stood up. His sturdy legs kicked the ocean shallows as he walked forward. It was an amazingly beautiful young man. His body surpassed the sculptures of ancient Greece. It was like the Apollo molded in bronze by an artist of the Peloponnesus school. It overflowed with gentle beauty and carried such a noble column of a neck, such gently sloping shoulders, such a softly broad chest, such elegantly rounded wrists, such a rapidly tapering tightly filled trunk, such legs, stoutly filled out like a heroic sword. The youth stopped at the water's edge and twisted his body to inspect his left elbow, which seemed to have struck against the corner of rock. As he did so, he bent his face and his right arm in the direction of the injury. The reflections on the waves, retreating past his feet, lit up his downturned profile as if an expression of joy had suddenly stolen across it. Quick, narrow eyebrows, deep, sad eyes, rather thick. Fresh lips these made up the design of his extraordinary profile. The wonderful ridge of his nose, furthermore, along with his controlled facial expressions, gave to his youthful good looks a certain chaste impression of wildness, as if he had never known anything but noble thoughts and starvation. This, together with the dark, controlled cast of his eyes, his strong white teeth, the languid way in which he unconsciously moved his wrists, the bearing of his quick body, brought out in full relief the inner nature of a young, beautiful wolf. That's it. Those looks are the beautiful features of the wolf. At the same time there was in the soft roundness of the shoulders, the innocent nudity of the chest, the charm of the lips. In these bodily features there was a mysteriously indefinable sweetness. Walter Pater mentioned, in connection with the lovely 13th century story, a miss and a mull, a certain sweetness of the early Renaissance. Shunsuk saw signs of a later and unimaginably mysterious and vast development of that early sweetness in the lines of the body of the youth before him. Shunsuk Inoki hated all the beautiful young men of the world. Yet beauty struck him dumb whether he liked it or not. Mostly, he had the bad habit of immediately connecting beauty with happiness. Yet what silenced his resentment here was perhaps not the perfect beauty of the youth but what he surmised to be his complete happiness. The youth glanced in Shunsuke's direction. Then he unconcernedly stepped out of sight behind a rock. After a time he appeared again, in white shirt and conservative blue serge trousers. Whistling, he started up the same stone steps Shunsuke had just descended. Shunsuke got up and followed him. The young man turned once again and glanced at the old man. Perhaps it was the effect of the summer sun shining across his eyelashes, but his eyes were quite dark. Shunsuk wondered why the youth, who had shone so resplendently earlier in his nakedness, had now lost his air of happiness, if nothing more. The youth took another path. It was going to be difficult to keep up with him. The exhausted old man started down the path doubting he had the energy to trace the young man's steps much farther. Then, however, somewhere in the vicinity of a grassy clearing within the wood, he heard the clear, vigorous sound of the young man's voice. Are you still sleeping? You amaze me. While you were sleeping, I swam way out into the ocean. Come on, get up, and let's stroll back. A girl stood up there under the trees. Shunsuk was shocked at how close she seemed to be as she stretched her slim arms above her head. Two or three of the buttons in the back of her blue, girlish western dress had come undone. For the first time he was able to see the youth as he fastened the errant buttons. The girl brushed from her skirt the pollen and soil she had collected during that quite indecorous nap on the grass. As she turned her hand to brush herself off, she showed her profile. It was Yasuko. Spent, Shunsuk slumped on the stairs. He took out a cigarette and lit it. It was not an uncommon thing for this expert in the art of jealousy to be filled with a mixture of admiration, jealousy, and defeat, but this time Shunsuke's heart was involved not with Yasuko but with that youth whose beauty was such a rarity in this world. In that perfect youth were consented all the dreams of the ugly writer's young days, dreams he had hidden from the eyes of men. Not only that, he rebuked himself for them. The springtime of intellect, the time when it begins to grow, that was the poison, 
he felt, that caused the young man to lose his youth even as he watched. Shunsuke's youth was spent in the frenzied pursuit of youthfulness. What foolishness, indeed. Youth tortures us with all kinds of hopes and despairs, but at least we do not realize that our pains are the normal agonies of youth. Shunsuke, however, spent his whole youth realizing it. He rigidly excluded from his thinking, from his consciousness, from his theorizing on literature and youth, everything connected with permanence, universality, common interest, everything unhappily subtle, in short, romantically immortal. To some extent, his foolishness lay in facetiously impulsive experimentation. At that time his one fond hope was that he would be so fortunate as to be able to see in his own pain the perfect, consummate pain of youth. Not only that, he wished to see in his own joy the consummate joy. In sum, he saw in it a power indispensable to humankind. This time, being defeated won't bother me a bit, he thought to himself. He is the possessor of all the beauty of youth. He dwells in the sunshine of human existence. Never will he be polluted by the poisons of art or things of that sort. He is a man born to love and be loved by woman. For him, I shall gladly retire from the field. Not only that, I welcome it. So much of my life has been spent fighting against beauty. But the time is approaching that beauty and I should shake hands in reconciliation. For all I can tell, heaven has sent these two people for me to see. The two lovers approached single file down the narrow path. Yasuka was the first to see Shunsuke. She and the old man confronted each other. His eyes showed pain, but his mouth was smiling. Yasuko grew white and dropped her glance. Still looking at the ground, she asked, Have you come here to work? Yes. I just got here. The youth looked at Shunsuke inquiringly. Yasuko introduced them, This is my friend Yuchi. Minami, he said, supplying his surname. When he heard Shunsuke's name, the youth did not seem at all surprised. Shunsuke Six thought to himself, he's probably heard about me from Yasuko. That's why he's not surprised. I would be delighted if he had never so much as looked at my complete works in three editions and had never heard my name. The three climbed the stone park staircase in the dead calm, chatting idly about how deserted the resort seemed. Shunsuke felt expansive. He wasn't one easily given to joking like a man of the world, but he was cheerful enough. The three got into his hired car and went back to the hotel. They ate supper detour. It was Yuchi's idea. After the meal they separated and went to their rooms. Later, Yuchi, tall in his hotel robe, appeared at the door of Shunsuke's room. May I come in? Are you working? He called through the door. Come in. Yasuko was taking a long time in the bath and I got bored, he said, by way of excuse. His dark eyes, however, had grown more sad since the daytime. Shunsuke's artistic instincts told him that some kind of confession was forthcoming. For a time they talked about insignificant matters. Then it became apparent that the youth was impatient to get something off his mind. At last he said, Are you going to stay here for a while? I expect so. I, if I can. Would like to leave by the 10 o'clock boat this evening, or by tomorrow morning's bus. In fact, I want to get away from here tonight sometime. Surprised, Shunsuke asked, what about Yasuko? That's what I've come to talk to you about. Can I leave her with you? I've thought perhaps you would like to marry her. I hope you are not being held back by something that is not true. Not at all. I can't stay here another night. Why? The youth answered in sincere, rather frozen tones. Do you understand? I can't love a woman. Do you know what I mean? My body can love them, but my interest in them is purely intellectual. I have never wanted a woman since the day I was born. I have never seen a woman and wanted her. Just the same I have deluded myself about it, and now I have deceived an innocent girl in the bargain. A strange light came into Shunsuke's eyes. By nature he was not sensitive to this problem. His inclinations were quite normal. He replied, then what can you love? I... 
The youth's face reddened. I only love boys. Have you told Yasuko about this? Shunsuke asked. No. Then don't tell her. It won't work. There are some things that are good to tell a woman, and some things not. I don't know much about your particular problem, but it seems to be something women wouldn't understand. When a girl appears who loves you as much as Yasuko seems to, it would seem best to marry her, since you have to get married sometime. Don't take marriage as being anything more than a triviality. It's trivial, that's why they call it sacred. Shunsuke began to take a fiendish delight in the encounter. Then he caught the young man's gaze and, out of deference to the world, decorously whispered, and these three nights. Didn't anything happen? No. That's fine. That's how women should be taught. Shunsuke's laugh was loud and clear. None of his friends had ever heard him laugh like this. I can tell you from long experience that it never pays to teach a woman pleasure. Pleasure is a tragic masculine invention. Don't take it as anything more than that. An ecstatic, parental affection floated in Shunsuke's eyes. You two will have an ideal married life, I am sure. He didn't say, happy. As far as Shunsuke was concerned it was splendid that this marriage seemed to hold in store such complete unhappiness for the woman. With Yuchi's help he felt he could send a hundred still virgin women off to nunneries. In this way Shunsuke for the first time in his life knew real passion.